Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Radley Horton, um, and I'm a climate scientist with Columbia's Climate School. In just a couple minutes, we are going to kick off the really exciting webinar titled Pastoral Follies and Lived Wisdom. This is going to be a, a really exciting um, take on some of the themes leading into our managed retreat conference, which, which officially um, kicks off next week. So before we turn to the, today's panel itself, I wanted to give a little bit of background. This is the second of two sort of lead-in uh, pre-event webinars for our main conference on managed ret retreat, which starts next Tuesday, June 20th. And um, Adrian is going to put in the chat information uh, for folks about how to register for the conference next week if you haven't uh, done so yet. Um, so for those of you who have attended our, our conference in the past, um, you know, you're going to see a lot of similar themes, a major focus on environmental justice issues, implementation, the sort of nuts and bolts of managed retreat and, and planned relocation, um, with, with the noticeable increase in, in actual activities underway, um, more and more tools out there like buyouts being used um, to address these topics. And we have additional themes. We're bringing forward ideas around habitability. Uh, what does that mean to different communities um, and the importance of thinking more generally about mobility um, and, and migration in these in these discussions. So again, the conference itself will be really exciting. Starts next Tuesday, runs until 3 p.m. on Friday. You can see how to register, learn about the exciting sessions um, through the link in the chat. Um, we've already got over 400 people registered to attend in person and over 100 online. Um, and there's, as I say, still time uh, to, to register. So with that, I'm really excited now to take sort of initial steps to towards introducing um, our panel uh, today to discuss the pastoral follies uh, and lived wisdom uh, topic. So I'll, I'll do um, quick bios um, to get us going. And then um, from there, I will turn it over to, to Noah to give to tell a little more about the structure of the session, who's going to speak for how long, when there will be Q&A, um, uh, and, and then to give, give the first presentation. Okay, so um, Noah Gottlieb is an architectural designer and researcher based in London. He studies architecture uh, at TMU, uh, formerly known as Ryerson University. I hope I'm, I'm uh, saying that right, in, in Toronto, Canada, um, and the Architecture Association in London where he gained his uh, master's in architecture and uh, AA diploma with distinction. In 2022, he returned to the AA uh, to teach in his undergraduate design studios, in its undergraduate design studios. Noah has worked for a number of international practices in the UK and Canada, in, including Voigt, um, Allison Brooks Architects, and, and Partisans. Um, next, uh, introduce Aviva Romani, um, whose international career includes public art, museum and gallery exhibits, and publications. Her work has been written about and awarded numerous grants and fellowships. In 2022, she authored Divining Chaos, the Autobiography of an Idea, and co-edited Eco Art in Action, Activities, Case Studies, and Provocations for Classrooms and Communities. Her eco art projects include Ghost Nets and the Blue Trees Project, installed and copyrighted to challenge eminent domain takings by natural gas corporations across North America, culminating with an injunction in a 2018 mock trial produced by a blade of grass. Romani holds a PhD in environmental sciences, technology and studio art from Plymouth University UK and a GIS certificate from Lehman College. She received her MFA and BFA from Cal Arts. Um, finally, last but not least, very excited to introduce uh, Charlene Stevens, uh, who earned a BA in art history at the University of California, uh, Los Angeles, UCLA, studied art education and photography at uh, California State University, Los Angeles, um, and film and photographic studies at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. In 2016, she founded a digital art publication, Arcade Project, and in 2020 launched a contemporary art gallery, Arcade Project Curatorial. Her curatorial projects include Dark Meat, a series of mixed media works on paper by Elizabeth Axtman at Satellite Art Show, Austin SXSW 2019, Twisted Twins, an installation by Eva Muller, um, Satellite Art Show in Brooklyn, um, many, many um, initiatives, um, including curating Gay Gorilla, New Conversations and Queer Abstraction, an online group exhibition inspired by composer Julius Eastman and Rainbow Country. 
a solo exhibition of works on paper by Kevin Darmini at Paradise Palace, Brooklyn. In 2021, she co-curated Current Undercurrent with Linda Griggs at the University of Massachusetts Hampton Gallery in Amherst. She's a contributing author, writer for Hyperallergic and Foam magazines, and has been featured in Forbes, Artnet News, Craft and Grip and Bedford and Bowery. So I apologize for those long introductions, but really conveys uh, the breadth of experience and talent um, of our three ex exciting speakers today. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Noah again to give us a, a little more sense about the structure, how he wants that you how you all want to receive questions and answers, which will be through the Q and A feature um, that you can see um, uh, in, in the webinar. And then from there, Noah can, can, can jump into the first talk. So with that, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Noah. Thank you. Uh, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Radley. The talk will be organized in four components. Um, so I will be speaking first, uh, then Charlene, and then Aviva, each for roughly 20 minutes. Uh, then the remainder of our session will be a Q&A or an open discussion. Um, please feel free to um, uh, ask your questions through the Q&A box, uh, preferably not through the chat, but through the Q&A so we can have a kind of measured list of all the responses, which um, we will each be going through as, as the talks proceed. Um, so I will begin now with um, moving to the first, uh, the, my first uh, talk, and I just want to um, confirm basically that, sorry about the, um, uh, actually I will be just doing it like this. Um, so you can all see my screen. Looks good. Yes. <clears throat> So, um, as I just said, my name is Noah Gottlieb. I'm an architect and researcher based in London, England, or based between London, England and my hometown of Toronto, Canada. Um, I'm working in landscape architecture and teach intermittently at my uh, alma mater, the Architectural Association in London. My talk today, Walden and Retreats, uh, will focus on the impact the managed retreat has on the depiction of the North American landscape in art and culture. My work on this topic began as a master's thesis at the Architectural Association, and the project's initial focus was the Jeffersonian grid, the vast network of roads which covers the center of North America between the Appalachians and the Rockies. This initial work was resolved in a short film studying infrastructural collapse and proposing guidelines for the strategic abandonment of roads, settlements, and farmland across the areas of the U.S. and Canada, which are covered by the grid. The project for me grew out of a fascination with abandonment. From Detroit to Western ghost towns to Chernobyl, the abandonment of landscapes from sudden and violent changes is often romanticized and co-opted at the expense of those who've just had to flee. This trend of ruin porn sparked my interest in abandonment's practical applications for climate change adaptation and something beyond the kind of purely visual representation. But this uh, kind of obsession with um, abandonment always having a uh, kind of visual character in popular culture led me to a fascination with how the sort of the settler cultures of the US and Canada have been dominated since their inception by pastoral imagery, which has had a profound effect on, on shaping urbanization and colonial expansion. And these various visions of the rural emphasize autonomy on and dominance over the land as being a sacrosanct and unquestioned feature of life in North America. But the steadily growing prevalence of managed retreat undermines these cultural norms through the vacating of pro uh, private property in response to climate threats. Managed um, beyond its immediate impact on displaced communities and economies, managed retreat can also mark a paradigm shift in the depictions of landscape and art and culture. And so as climate change makes managed retreat a growing part of everyday life, um, how will the traditional depictions of the North American landscape change in turn? So the title for this talk comes from Henry David Thoreau's 1854 reflection on his time living removed from society next to Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, in it, in Walden, Thoreau rhapsodizes on the sensory experiences around the single room cabin he lived in between 1845 and 1847. In addition to the daily rhythms of wind and bird song, Thoreau described with trepidation the sound of a nearby railroad, which disturbed his otherwise tranquil homestead. The Fishburg Railroad touches the pond about 100 rods south of where I dwell. I usually go to the village along its causeway and am, as it were, related to society by its link. The whistle of the locomotive penetrates my woods in summer and winter, sounding like the scream of a hawk sailing over some farmer's yard. Here come your, um, here come your goods country, your groceries countrymen, nor is there any man so independent on his farm that he can say them nay. 
Diligence and committed to simple living for the sake of a transcendental connection with the natural world. Thoreau's frustration on hearing the locomotive speaks to an underlying anxiety about preserving an image of wilderness for himself. His position sitting a quarter mile from the crucial infrastructure systems building the laissez-faire economy of 19th century America perfectly underscores the contradictions that come with seeking privacy and self-reliance. This mythology of self-reliance on the land, which is crucial to the development of the U.S. and Canada, sees nature and society as two distinct realms, with the former being either a wild thing to be tamed or a place to escape to. Thoreau was not an absolutist about his isolation and self um, and self sufficiently, and regularly visited friends and family. But his keen perception on the increasing difficult, but was keenly um, aware of like the increasing difficulty of retreating from the sort of nascent industrial society growing around him. Um, Around the time that Thoreau was recording his experiences at Walden Pond, paintings like John Gass' American Progress or Thomas Cole's The Oxbow view the world through the lens of a society undergoing, undergoing aggressive military expansion and industrialization, making the landscape legible um, through demarcating property. In both paintings, a dark and mysterious land and peoples not legible to European settlers is washed away by light and quote unquote civilization. American progress has become an icon for manifest destiny, the 19th century cultural consensus that America's white Anglo-Saxon Protestant settlers were destined to extend across the North American continent. This action took place through the expulsion and genocide of indigenous peoples, as well as the suppression of any of their communal and nomadic traditions, which contradicted the settlers' exclusive notion of private property. The Oxbow, painted somewhat earlier, depicts the same ideology of American progress, but in a much more subtle way. In both images, the vertical divide between dark and light follows the rising of the sun in the east to the direction of the settlers travel in the west. And the conquest of the landscape is shown not by military action, but by the natural movement of the clouds, revealing the Connecticut River Valley's gentle landscape of homesteads and fields. Instead of the angel like Columbia, um, spirit of Columbia guiding settlers, divine guidance takes the form of industrial detritus. Logging scars on the other side of the valley form massive Hebrew letters, reading as either Noah when viewed straight up uh, or you know, normal side or Shaddai, a name of God in the Old Testament when viewed from upside down. And Cole's invoking of the flood of Genesis through ruined industrial spaces, showing the, the kind of wipe, the cleansing of the landscape and, the, and his, his perceived renewal of it through, through kind of European settlements, um, emphasizes all, all of the kind of assumptions of settler colonialism, colonialism which dominated romantic painting in 19th century America. Um, retreating from the lights of settler society, the, uh, the idyllic space and the idyllic and foreboding space on the left is replaced by a landscape centered around pro property ownership and resource extraction. Today, with climate change forcing the relocation of peoples across North America, spaces are left which carry the remnants of industrial works, uh, industrial society propagandized by earlier works like American Progress and the Oxbow. The artistic depiction of spaces resulting from retreat whether abandoned towns, flood plains, or new settlements of climate refugees, can art articulate a new cu a cultural approach to the landscape no longer based around domination and anthropocentrism. Um, sorry. So um, the kind of the like the um, secular landscape art emerged in northwestern Europe towards the seven towards the end of the 16th century, and this. Um, this trend had long been like, uh, of course, there's always been depictions of the landscape in, in artistic cultures, were, in, like in artistic traditions the world over. But um, the, 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 the trend of depicting the landscape uh, removed from any kind of religious connotations is something that rose in the mercantile economies of Northwestern Europe towards the end of the, um, uh, towards the end of the 17th century, as these countries began to move from feudal economies towards, um, uh, towards a more industrialized uh, system. And uh, the, further after this, in the in the late 18th, early 19th century, romantic arts began to um, uh, began to supplant that, uh, presenting like a sort of spiritual view of the world that was dis again disconnected from sort of institutional um, Christian traditions, and having and having the freedom to represent the landscape uh, devolve from any direct um, religious connotations or descriptions. And Thomas Cole was one of the um, uh, one of the original, um, basically most prominent um, romantic artists of 19th century America who. Um, uh, who basically influenced the whole tradition in the late throughout the mid and late 19th century of um, depicting areas that were still in the periphery of urbanization, particularly in upstate New York and New England, through this highly kind of colonial pastoral gaze by by showing the landscape as this kind of empty, pristine um, Garden of Eden, this kind of idyllic wilderness that was ready to be settled by Europeans. 
Um, Cole also viewed industrial society with a very similar suspicion to Henry David Thoreau because uh, his um, uh, and, and they viewed sort of industrial society as something sort of fleeting and um, and 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 impermanent in the world. And through paintings like his uh, series, The Course of Empire, the progression of um, the, the sort of rise and fall of a civilization is depicted from the savage states to the pastoral to uh, sorry. To, um, to the consummation of empire, to destruction, and to desolation. And all throughout um, a cliff in the background, which is painted from different points of view as, as each painting rotates around it, is shown as this kind of permanent backdrop showing that the, the sort of fleeting um, and impermanent human societies will sort of rise and fall, and nature will always be this permanent background, which is this, this kind of um, transcendental worship of nature, but also a very clear distinction of human society and the natural world being two fundamentally separate realms and any attempt to sort of fuse the two or achieve any kind of symbiosis or permanence is um, is, is futile. And after Cole's death in 1848, um, his pupils uh, began what is known as the Hudson River School uh, because they were primarily painting in the Hudson River a Valley of upstate New York. Um, and this movement, this romantic movement um, uh, was heavily influenced by a lot of German romanticists, including Caspar David Friedrich. And like Cole, who was an English emigre himself, a lot of the uh, romantic painters in the Hudson River School were also emigres, like the German Albert Bierstadt who ventured west in the in the late 19th century to, to sort of paint these majestic and almost psychedelic kind of views of, of the west and and, and the, the, the kind of mountain ranges of the Rockies. And this kind of uh, depiction of the natural of, of natural surroundings as something kind of foreboding and mysterious and unknown can be seen in sort of the early colonial depictions of the continent. Um, in this case, the, um, the the colonial plans for Savannah on the left and New Amsterdam, now New York on the right, which emphasize a very clear distinction between the settlements and the periphery as, um, as basically being an inherent part of European settlements. And throughout the 18th century, you see this very strict limitation about the boundaries of of, of any kind of settlement because it was still a like they still developed as military garrisons that were unable to exert power beyond their boundaries. But throughout the 19th century, uh, as as Manifest Destiny went underway, this um, both the forms of settlements changed, but also um, their depiction in popular culture changed as well. And you went from the sort of for, foreboding woods surrounding the settlement in Georgia to this kind of to a picturesque view, like almost uh, kind of reminiscent from like an English garden of the 18th century that surrounds an otherwise perfectly rational and um, and and kind of severe settlement, whether it's in Iowa or in or in um, or in Missouri, uh, hundreds of miles away. The both the form of settlement and the kind of picturesque qualities of or the the popular perception of the picturesque qualities around it remain the same. And. Uh, in basically in his um in his book uh, the art of not being governed the, the author uh, political scientist James Scott argues that nomadic peoples can best be thought of as um, attempts to under to to purposefully flee state making projects and as uh, as the kind of genocidal ambitions of of like westward expansion grew underway in the in the 18th and 19th centuries certain spaces were um uh, basically originated throughout the continent that um that that would form as these areas that would not be basically would not be conquerable by by um by settlers and in scott's case he was talking about a region of southeast asia which is never called which he calls zomia which is basically the highland massif of southeast asia which is a region that has never successfully been colonized by anybody i whether it be either europeans or the valley states um, of burma and vietnam and cambodia um, at lower elevations um, peoples who are fleeing persecution can always escape into the highlands um, and and basically not only escape and have freedom but live in the way that they choose to and in the 18th and 19th century there were multiple american smaller american zomias including the great dismal swamp which lies on the border between virginia and north carolina and this area with with densely uh, with dense and crocodile infested mangroves was never um, was never settled by Europeans and never was never able to be successfully settled by Europeans until very late uh, late 19th early 20th century. So up until the Civil War, it functioned as the space where um, escaped slaves could um, could retreat and not only but not only flee the, the flee the hunt from the slave masters but also establish independent communities inside. They were completely detached from white society, so they could live on their own terms. But even so, uh, be, having to live in this state of retreats, um, there's very little remnants of, of, the, um, of the settlements and, and artistic production that happened within. And all that's left is the kind of European gaze into it, which is still depicting this kind of mysterious 
and foreboding space, and that uh, that's also viewed as quite idyllic um, inside. And this is kind of a maybe a bit of a perverse um, sort of uh, comparison, but like this, this there's this always this sense of retreat and moving on and touring of the landscape that either from the settler point of view happens as a method of personal exploration in the case of Thoreau, or as a matter of life and death in the case of the Dismal Swamp Maroons. And towards the end of the 19th century, um, as Manifest Destiny progressed and basically completed itself across the continent, um, settler society had to reckon with a, a sort of landscape that had been um, removed of any of the sort of picturesque qualities that were imagined in earlier arts. Um, by the end, by the early 20th century, the landscape had been rationalized and destroyed of any uh, any uh, any either original nomadic settlements or original ecology to a landscape of pure extraction. Um, and the difficulties of maintaining this narrative of independence um, in an area that in inner context that had been so completely wiped out of any um, of any um, anything that the settlers could perceive as nature became sort of um, became a more acutely aware problem in popular culture. And one of the earliest artists to really highlight this with um, the uh, kind of sense of ironic detachment and humor is the artist Grant Wood, who you may know through the iconic painting American Gothic of the farmer and his wife standing behind this sort of um, small farmhouse in the Iowa countryside. And Wood's uh, position painting in the sort of the, in rural Iowa in, around the time of the Great Depression gave him this sort of um, almost comedic sort of veneration, but also a uh, critique of this kind of traditional depiction of the American landscape. And of course, a lot of his paintings are sort of reflected through um, the sort of uh, new tendencies and abstraction that had arose in painting by the early and mid, uh, by the early 20th century. But Wood basically kind of reflects this, this sort of traditional Americana, but infused with the sense of ironic detachment, which um, you can kind of, you can definitely clearly see in this image, Daughters of the Revolution, compared to um, the sort of highly didactic and earnest um, um, kind of patriotism and, and, and kind of love uh, that's displayed in like a Norman Rockwell piece. So, it's so there begins to there begins to emerge a trend where um, this this uh, kind of celebration of the frontier and of Americana and of the wilderness becomes um, a, like a, a, a sense of um, like it becomes a, a, a has a greater sense of precarity and worry as the economic pressures of urbanization and in this case the Great Depression become more and more acute and. You can see this trend begin to take place in photography as well, where you see in the um, in the early 20th century, uh, photographers like Ansel Adams venturing out west in a very similar way that um, painters like Bierstadt did 60, over 60 years earlier, recording the landscape in this kind of majestic sort of imperial vision that is brought back to the public to to kind of communicate the idea of, an, of a pristine wilderness beyond um, beyond the Rockies, which uh, could be, which is either uh, either a spit, which could be is no longer a space to escape from the state, but now is escaped um, a place to escape to to make one's fortune in the West. And a photographer who, like Wood in painting, countered this significantly in photography was uh, Walker Evans, who um, was a photographer working working with Time and Life magazine and throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s, who um, under uh, basically under the auspices of the Farm Security Administration, which was a New Deal organization that was set up to support um, farming in the wake of the Great Depression, went on huge multi-year ventures throughout the South, making systematic recording of the state of houses and farms and sharecroppers and small businesses and kind of like very methodical snippets of everyday life as he sort of made these enormous um, uh, journeys, like road trips throughout the South. And uh, this work became immensely popular in the in America in the 1930s. And in fact, Evans was the first photographer to receive a solo show at MoMA. And it began to articulate in sort of popular consciousness a new sort of conception of the American landscape as a place in decay and no longer a place of sort of bounty and perpetual expansion. Evan's photos showed uh, removed any of the glamour that um, that had uh, that the previous like paintings of Bierstadt or Cole had, showing the landscape as a very precarious place and a place of exploitation, which uh, which you know was basically sort of popping bubbles in a sense. And this trend began to continue into the 1960s and 70s, especially with the publication in 1978 of New Topographics, or it was an exhibition and then became a publication afterwards. 
And curator William Jenkins grouped together um, a number of mostly American photographers who sort of built off of Evans' um, kind of journeys of the road trip, traveling through the South and the Midwest and the American West to show, uh, to basically move from a sort of fetishization of, um, of like a virgin wilderness to a fetishization of that wilderness and decay from the result of industrialization and, and um, colonial expansion. And th this becomes very obvious when you look at certain uh, paintings. So this is showing the ones from before, from Ansel, a photograph of Ansel Adams and Albert Bierstadt to some of the photographs included within. Stephen Shore, the only color photo the only uh, color photography included in the exhibition, makes very clear satires of um, of, of sort of earlier um, kind of 19th century and like 19th century photography and painting, which show this sort of majestic landscape. And in, in this case, he's it, like any kind of majestic image is reduced to the image itself on a billboard or the kind of um, uh, in like even in the image on the right, which shows a very similar scene in Yosemite that Adams had photographed 30 years earlier. Um, he describes how people will drive for four hours only to appreciate the landscape for a bare couple of minutes before uh, retreating backwards to their their um, to their home. And um, the the German couple Bernd and Hilla Becker, who were the only Europeans invited in the in the exhibition, um, also followed a very similar uh, trajectory to Evans. In fact, retracing his steps in a lot of areas and and basically reframing and recomposing his shots that were made um, over or sometimes over fifty years earlier. And the Beckers became famous for these sort of um, uh, highly systematic imagery of different types of industrial structures, which they started photographing in their native Germany and then moved on to basically the areas of the Rust Belt, in this case, um, coal mine infrastructure in Pennsylvania. And it the, the the sort of again this is like it's like the next step from Evans, which is sort of revol like removing from the landscape any sense of mystique, but also beginning to um, beginning to admire and finding beauty in in this this sort of thing that has destroyed it. So in a way, like it it like something like this, like the a coal tipple outside, could it be, even be seen as like a new sort of remnant of. Um, the, the kind of logging scars that can be seen in, in Thomas Cole's The Oxbow. It's this new celebration of um, like a kind of crumbling and and sort of collapse of the landscape is the new thing to be sort of um, mythologized. And so, yeah, so a lot of this, um, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, the photography New topographics became hugely influential for decades afterwards. The Beckers went on to found, help found the Dusseldorf School of Photography, which produced um, photographers like Andreas Gursky and Thomas Strutz and Candida Hoffer, um, who then influenced the whole new um, level of uh, photographers afterwards, like uh, Bas Prinsen, who were focused not on this sort of majestic depiction of the landscape, but were obsessed with this, um, this sort of view of the kind of crumbling and crumbling and banal aspects of industrial society and the sort of um, liminal and typical and like very ordinary spaces that it produces. But this this attitude, while it may look very different to like the sort of 19th century romanticism, is this kind of in is like is this basically the same sort of detached gaze of an outsider, typically white European outsider venturing into North America to basically photograph from a distance and from a detached perspective something which is um, perceived as pristine and um, either untouchable or to be venerated either for its um, lack of uh, interference by humans or the sort of the, its its state of decay after humans have left. Um, and this could be seen, uh, especially in a lot of contemporary photography in the last um, in the last 10 years with um, the sort of imagery that has abounded of places like Detroit, especially after the 2008 financial crash. And then this article from Vice, um, the photographer comments that people love to take the shot and crop it so it's just like a prairie and say, look, this is a mile from downtown, it's turned into the woods, when he says, in fact, there's multiple busy in heavy industry located just beyond it. So it sort of, um, the, 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 the kind of clipping of this image sort of reinforces the same sort of pastoral viewpoint and it's, except it is sort of inverted towards like the, the the center of like decaying urban centers and even when uh the even when sort of um the the kind of imagery of the pastoral is actually created in these places like for example this is a um a community like a communally owned farm and in the middle of detroit it's um it has a uh it has a highly different impact than um than sort of previous depictions or usage of the landscape would be because it is um it 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 stresses like a sort of communal action and communal productivity and and ownership of the land rather than a um a kind of exclusive use and and sort of detachment from it and sort of preserving sort of image of the landscape so that 
um, this kind of pastoral tendency in popular culture always tends towards some form of domination or simplification of the landscape, which eliminates any kind of contrasting um, abilities to, to, to use it. Um, and I want to make a slight uh, venture from uh, the this 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 sort of like art his, art historical progression towards um, some of the work that I've completed um, or have been working on uh, in the last couple of years um, since the completion of the original project I spoke about earlier. As I mentioned earlier, my thesis project was about these uh, was was essentially documenting the process of managed retreat throughout the U.S. and highlighting how um, the basically the further up the chain of government you go, the less coordination there is or sort of understanding um, about the, the sort of uh, the impacts of this. And I became quite interested in um, imagining what it would be, what it would mean to depict a landscape that, um, in in ways that would sort of emphasize the, the 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 kind of future impacts of managed retreat, and from that sort of understand how um, how maps and depictions of the landscape uh, basically structure our notions of of like of the landscape and how we perceive it. Um, and and this was based on the grid. And what, one thing that I, I I found particularly compelling is that especially for areas of the Midwest, there's always this perception that it's a landscape to be um, seen as part of like uh, to be viewed purely on a large scale and to be viewed from the top down. So even from the, and what I find very interesting is that even from the template for urbanization in the form of the Jeff Jeffersonian grid, which arose in, in uh, 1785, when it began to be implemented, and for example, this is the first implementation of the grid in what's now Southeastern Ohio, a place called the Seven Ranges. Um, you can see um, in, the, in the writings, there was always and the, 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 the sort of planners expressed uh, frustration with the actual ability to imprint such a rigid form on the landscape because the landscape didn't agree with it. You can see that from the um, planner, um, from the um, colonial surveyor Thomas Hutchins, the conflict with river systems. In fact, they, they're they're being forced to basically rejig the format, the the pattern, many times in order to keep to this kind of consistent idea. And the consistency of the urban form was very important because it was basically a tool of financial speculation. It was a, it was an ability to basically sell sell the land of others uh, in case um, Hutchins was was part of a, a militia that would run out that would go out into this landscape fortify and and uh, basically push out indigenous inhabitants before staking down the grid and basically use stake and stake and down property to be able to sell that to before any of those people had arrived so it like this it was an early form of um of financial speculation and so I what I wanted to do with these is basically to show to show the land in section highlighting um, the kind of minor changes in topography for a landscape that's always seen as very flat and consistent and homogenous. Um, showing how the um, minor changes of topography, in this case, the topography is highly exaggerated, um, make like actually creates um, quite substantial impacts on the landscape and how these area, the area, the, the sort of wooded areas, the areas that would become um, sort of flood flood risk flood risk zones would be a, a greater, a better, basically uh, land and settlements would be at a greater risk of um, of flooding and would have to be. Um, retreated from. And basically, I'm, it's kind of the first uh, step for me to sort of create a series of these images, which are more about sort of understanding how uh, the landscape can be viewed and sort of creating um, images which are projective, like plans for the grid, but ones which don't, don't attempt to assert a kind of dominance over the landscape in the same way. And uh, with that, I um, I just want to say that my um, this initial part of the presentation has had a very uh, has had a very specific focus on the um, on the sort of uh, colonial and Western canon, and that's how we we've, we've been sort of organizing this in a sort of chronological fashion. So, I after presenting the sort of Western canon and things to be uh, to, like the sort of groundwork of um, what we what we've learned for a long time, I want to move it over to uh, Charlene and Aviva to basically explain the counter examples and the sort of counter. Hold on. Hold on. Um, <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. Hi, I'm <laughs> Charlene Stevens. Um, thank you so much. No, did I break in too soon? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Um, so I guess uh, we'll switch the screen sharing. Okay. And is this, um, is the, are we on the full screen? 
Yes, it looks good. Okay, good. I just want to make sure. Okay, so hi, my um, I'm going to continue the theme of the pastoral that Noah has introduced, um, and you can't have the American pastoral without the Black pastoral, since the pastoral is about land and land ownership, and you know, and um, we have always been like Africans have always been like attached to land as far as the United States, um, in the United States. And, um, and I've invited Christoph Carr, the co-founder of Black Land Ownership. He is an anti-capitalist, pro-humanity educator, organizer, artist, conservationist, and human exploring the existential crisis of being. And so, just introducing the cons. So I was thinking of the America. Noah and I were talking about like the pastoral, and and um, and the British past, um, pastoral and land politics. And I was thinking about the American pastoral, and the Black pastoral, and that would be plantation. You know, the landscape. Um, you know, what you had in a plantation is. It um, is um, a group trying to emulate the aristocracy in England. And so and a good example of this is Mount Vernon, the historical home of um, our first president, George Washington. And it's a good example um, there. We have two examples and they're good examples of um, how the style subject um, POV of landscape town paintings changed with the uh, with the agenda of the times. So, and I can't see my notes. I'm so sorry. But we have a uh, we have a view of George Washington um, George Washington's house in um, in um, 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 of Mount Vernon, and this is like a typical like um, antebellum period past um, pastoral painting. Um, everything's there. Everything looks beautiful except for you know the big um, you know elephant in the room, the three hundred enslaved Africans that have made this scene possible, that are the labor behind, you know, this idyllic scene. And so this is an, ex um, so that little, if you look at the top right, um, that little house for families, those are the slave quarters. And they just blend in, you don't see any black bodies. But another view of the house, taken from that right side shows is um, you know shows the slave quarters front and center with the resident um, with the um, the residents now another thing about like the depiction of um, enslaved Africans and um, in these paintings they're usually very at this um, this um, period they're usually very small like they're part of the landscape they're they're, um, you know, they're counted with the, you know, I mean, the chattels counted with the livestock almost. And um, so if seen, not really, this, definitely not the subject. Now, after um, the post antebellum Ellen period, post, um, post emancipation, all of a sudden labor became front and center and the agenda behind this changed. It's um, it's similar to um, the reason why Confederate statues were put up during um, were erected during the Civil Rights period. It was um, it was a means to um, it was a way to try to establish or reestablish that racial hierarchy and those systems of power through this imagery. So like this labor didn't even no one you know the labor wanted to be hidden until they lost the war. And then it was all memories of the good old days. 
So one of the, um, a good, an, an example is, um, this is a black, um, Robert S. Duncanson is a black landscape painter. He's biracial. His father was Scottish, mother, um, mother of African descent, um, born in New York. Um, he was a free, um, he was a free person of color. And um, many of his patrons were um, white abolitionists. And it's very interesting to see, there he is, he's very fair, which helped him get through a lot of door you know, um, um, in white society. And um, Duncanson did, the, he was self-taught. He did, he was able to, um, do the full grand tour of Europe, and also um, is associated with the Hudson Hudson River School, and um, and um, and that's and that is the style in which he paints. So this is his most famous painting, um, the Lotus Eaters. Um, that's what most people associate um, Duncanson with. And this one, and I'm so sorry again, I don't have my notes. So I'm like guessing this, is, I think it's view of, um, I guess view of Cincinnati from the Ohio River um, from Kentucky. And this is where the landscape painting that at one time was to reinforce hierarchies. You know, this is where the, submer the subversive messages start coming through. And you know, from his patrons, you know, probably at the request or support of um, the white abolitionists who um, I, who commissioned these works. So in here, you have like the line of demarcation between slavery and freedom, and in the foreground in Kentucky, you know, it's like you know, you have the agrarian scene with these tiny, tiny <laughs> enslaved Africans. They're you know, they part of the landscape um, still. And across the river, it's more industrialized. Um, you know, and just showing that contrast um, was a pretty subversive act at that time. Now, I also, you know, had to, you know, looked at, there was also the down, the, the, um, the, the dark side, I guess, or the downside of the influence of the white abolitionist patron is still centering the white subject. So this is from, oh, I think it's Eva, Uncle Tom, it's from chapter 22 of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And uh, you see Uncle Tom is like kind of almost blending in with the shadows as the little girl, you know, looking up to God, you know, with their arm out, um, outstretched is the only one that's bathed in that divine light. So it still has that, um, patronizing, uh, or, or pretty much like, or it still has, it, it's, it's, it's still from the a white gaze that still, even though it was the abolition movement, it's very telling of, you know, that it, it only went so far. So, after, the Civil War, we were promised by Sherman, 40 acres and a mule. And it said, each family shall have a plot of no more than 40 acres of tillable ground. And when it borders on some water channel with not more than 800 feet waterfront in the possession of which land the military authorities will afford them protection, until such time as they can protect themselves or until Congress shall regulate that title. And didn't quite happen. And this is Winslow Homer's The Cotton Pickers, which kind of really shows the reality of the post antebellum South, which you know the old the new South looked like just like the old South. And um, you know, represented an era of exploitation through uh, sharecropping. But you know, there also were 
you know, even though I don't have time to give all the success stories, you know, there also was a time where, you know, pe even though the 40 acres and a mule didn't happen, there was, you know, there was black land ownership because, you know, what do you even identify being an American with, you know, be, you know when this country was founded, you know, citizenship, you know, was reliant upon land ownership. You weren't even a person. <laughs> I think that even went back to Greece, you know, where you couldn't even uh, participate in a democracy without owning land. So here we come to black land ownership. And you know, I wanted to, I don't know if you want to jump in, Chris, um, um, or if I should just continue as we're going to get to uh, where you are. And I'm just going to, I'm going to come in with some statistics about um, farmland, or do you want to um, come in now and um, talk about the, um, where, uh, you know, what we've, what I've discussed so far? Well, there, there are a couple of things. Um, I think it'd be good to get through some of the statistics you had prepared, but as we get there, hey, how you doing? I'm Chris, co-founder of Blackland Ownership. Uh, we're currently upstate now on one of the properties. We have 15 acres of conservation land. Uh, we're trying to take a non-exploitative approach. So the land is observed by the Otsego Land Trust. And then we have a 22-acre property near Richfield Springs, which is for artist retreats, wellness, getting your hands in the dirt, learning how to do permaculture and what have you. I already went, picked up a whole bunch of lumber today. We're building out here. And, and I'd like to kind of, the idea of the pastoral is very interesting from the point of view of, by definition, if we're talking about farmland or ranch land or rural America, what does that hold for people of African descent? And if we're starting with areas that are affected by slavery, captivity of folks, there can sometimes be a misunderstanding or the idea that all Black folks came here through slavery or that our only attachment to land is as property or chattel. And I am one of the advocates and believers that Africans traveled the world prior to Columbus. I am a believer that there were free Africans coming during the same time period as enslaved Africans. And our relationship with land differs ideologically, epistemologically, and historically in you don't have the same partition between nature and human. And this concept of what is dominance or use or stewardship or engagement with land. Then when you think about the representation of that, when do individuals have the ability to make art? In our contemporary society, it takes very little. Everything you already bought is right in front of you. But at a certain point, you had to have time. You had to have safety. You had to have a space. You had to have a market. And when you are marketed, and a product and chattel, or you are a free person fighting to be considered human, is art going to be your predominant focus? Is there anything to do with your art? Now, you may make artifice, or you may have items created amongst community, but what we're seeing is partially propaganda. What we're well, partially I think it's, it's all propaganda. Even, like, you know, um, Duncanson, you know, he was a free Black person of color during the antebellum period. Um, his main his main thing was art. It wasn't a side gig. I mean, he was painting houses for a second, but um, he really, he really rode the train to success for a bit, and then you know, flamed out early. But and so, uh, but it's all, but it's all an agenda. I mean, as I was saying, even as a black artist, he was still, you know, um, he 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 still had to follow the whims of his his white patrons, even though they meant well, you know, even, you know, even still like, you know, um, representing their paternalistic fantasy. And, and something to also think about is with all of the artists that we've looked at, there's an element of once you've made art, once you do have the safety, you have the time, you have the space, you have a market, you have a way of distribu distributing it, then who are the supporters for the patrons, as well as then the industrial capacity for that? So we saw the difference when people were making individual paintings versus publishing maps. If there is a printer or a, another institution that has to then propagate the artwork made, how does that change? And how does that affect the possible propagandistic element of it? Well, it, the last um, piece. Just real quick, um, just, just real quick. Okay. Just, I just want to get through this part All real right. quick. Um, and what it makes me think about is the real estate of people's minds. 
And we're talking about the pastoral in a physical geographic sense. And we're talking about representations of that that are reflected through individual artists or communities that experience that art. But a question that comes up for me is always, well, who owns the real estate of your mind and what's being done with that real estate? How is that being cordoned off, gridded, quantified, placed in a commodifiable exchange system? And none of the artists can escape that because we deal with society and we deal with then what is influence. And in thinking about ruralism, urbanism, and what pushes artists to create the art, I would want to encourage folks who are watching this or participating in it is to think about the real estate of your mind and what is the countryside of your mind? What's the pastoral? Where's the recreation? Do Black people have access to that? Are well, we that is, I think that is, okay, and this is where I need to get through the rest of this and answering your, um, to hopefully start exploring that question. And I'm so sorry. And it's all, it's in the mind. And especially because the pastoral is a fantasy. It is a delusion. It is a uh, rational, you know, it is, the, it is the fantasy of manifest destiny. It is the delusion of dominion over all creatures and all, nat and all nature. And so, um, so, and also that delusion in our access, you know, it has always been, the nature has never been marketed to black people. Like they don't market camping, hunting um, equipment. Um, they don't market outdoor stuff to us. You know, we were allowed to be part of the landscape, but we are not allowed to own the landscape, be stewards of the landscape or enjoy the landscape. So going on with black landowners, a few of the statistics, over a century, black farmers were stripped of 80% of their farmland, amounting to millions of acres and hundreds of billions of dollars of lost in lost wealth. Following the Civil War, black farmers built up millions of acres of farmland, but white landowners and lenders stripped black farmers of their land by forcing them into debt and sometimes seizing their land outright through terror and manipulation. Meanwhile, the federal government purposely excluded black farmers from New Deal policies meant to provide relief for to struggling farmers. Whereas black farmers made up 14% of the farming population into 1910, today black farmers account for less than 2% of farmers, a number that may itself be unreliable due to the historic failure of the agricultural census to accurately count black farmers. So an example of this so pretty much black land ownership, especially rural black land ownership is a radical act in itself. And an example of this and the pushback, um, this was a big thing trending on TikTok. And then because of TikTok, we became a big story of Freedom Acres Ranch. And this is Nicole Mallory and her husband, Courtney, own a 640 acre ranch in rural Yoder, a predominantly white town about hundred miles Southeast of Denver. El Paso County prosecutors charged them with felony stalking, tampering with the utility meter and petty theft on February 6th in connection with, the, with an ongoing dispute with a neighbor. Covering Colorado now, taking us down to El Paso County where a farmer and his wife are embroiled in a legal... The people down there talking. Michael Abeda made the drive down I-25 to get this story. It's a story out of El Paso County that is getting national attention. A farming couple say they are the target of continued racial harassment online and in person. And today, with the help of the NAACP, one of them is being bailed out of jail. Courtney and Nicole Mallory say they own a ranch encompassing a thousand acres in El Paso County. They first made headlines a few weeks ago when their story was posted on a digital outlet. They say that among other things, they've been harassed and their property vandalized. We are stalked, we are harassed, we are chased, we are followed. Um, there's been spray paint where they put on items on our home. 
El Paso County Sheriff's Office won't talk on camera, but they say in the past two years, they've responded to more than 170 calls for service that involved the individuals in the article. They say they will release legal documents and body camera upon request. We've made that request, but we're still waiting to receive those documents. Courtney Mallory was arrested Monday on a warrant for felony stalking, and after spending the night in jail, his bond was set at $6,000. On Tuesday, the NAACP is planning to post bond for Mallory, and he will be released. This is a complicated story. We'll continue to talk to Courtney and Nicole, as well as try to get our hands on those police documents. We'll continue to update you as this story evolves. In Colorado Springs, Michael Aveta, covering Colorado First. Covering Colorado now taking us down to a... Sorry. And... We'll try to get us out of here without starting this video again. There we go. <laughs> Covering Colorado, taking us down to El Paso I'm County so where sorry. a and his wife are embroiled in a lit. So I might, if, um, give me a moment. I might have to go back into the PowerPoint, sorry. Oh, <laughs> thank you for your patience. So the Mallory's were just doing something that any white couple, like a lot of did during the pandemic, before the Mallory's bought their current property in August, 2020, they were living in Houston, Texas, growing herbs and tomatoes in their backyard, even while living in the big city. In early 2019, they began to reevaluate their living situation. You know, just like with COVID, a lot of people kind of changed professions, said Nicole Mallory. You have people that went into doing things they loved so that they knew that their, um, their life had purpose. I believe that's what led us here, having a ranch and growing our own food. And it's not, I mean, this is something that to a lot of, you know, people who have white, have white privilege, you know, can just, I'm gonna go to the country and grow food. And it's no big deal where black people just like driving across the country you know, can't just, can't drive anywhere, can't just live anywhere, you know, without, you know, they're having them owning, you know, just like my owning land is something radical. And in a time where we have so much food insecurity with Black Americans, you know, and so, you know, just growing one, owning land and grow and being part of the means of production of growing, growing one's own food against this pushback, you know, is like, you know, a radical act. So charges were dropped, you know, this um, in May, this had happened back, I think in February, but, you know, until they got the social media and, um, and uh, legacy media attention, um, the cops, um, the, the, the law enforcement really didn't do anything for these people. And so, you know, it, you know, same old, same old. So back to people, black people, you know, working to live, you know, that dream, you know, really, re and I think it's like redefining the pastoral into something, you know, from something that was exclusive and racialized to something that is inclusive, you know, you know, um, it, to allow for and or to make room for um you know black people producing black food production black joy um so chris um real quick because i and we are beginning to run out of time but we will have questions after um can you would you like to add a little more about you know what you're doing um with your project on your land and what is your goal um, we are here to try to rectify or and balance out the historical injustice when it comes to land ownership in the country and specifically looking at what's happened with people of African descent and the reality of, yeah, in 1890, there were more Black farmers than now. And statistically, that shouldn't be possible when you look at population growth. It's not just a movement of urbanism or anti-ruralism that does take place, but there is 
I would say, direct policy initiatives coming out of the antebellum time period into the time period and then um, New Deal time period, World War II, expansion of highway systems or what have you. And so we look up now and less than 2% of farmers are Black. When you look at land ownership, 96% of privately held rural land is owned by people of European descent. So all the Black folks, all the Spanish folks, all the immigrant folks are having to split 4%. Well, then how will we have justice? When you look at issues around education, when you look at issues around healthcare, when you look at food access, when you look at over um, the, the inundation of surveillance and police state mechanisms, all of that comes down to who owns the land, who gets to dictate policy, and who gets to have autonomy and their daily vision. So we're advocating people to look into the history. If you go to our website, we have a lot of statistics, and we did a breakdown of land ownership policy from 1820 up till basically uh, 2022, and looking at legislation policy actions uh, done by either institutions, government, or large-scale private institutions um, that directly gave favor to certain communities and directly inhibited, stifled, or terrorized other communities. What we're doing beyond building resources and information and connecting with other landowners is then digging into how other communities have been marginalized and working in solidarity with uh, members of the queer community, members who are queer and Black and women or Black queer trans women, uh, working with Native communities. And I'm in Otsego County, yet when you ask people up here, well, where is the community of the folks who used to live here? They don't live here anymore. This county is 99% white. The county next to it is 99% white. The county next to that one's 99% white. Um, and we are looking to then build with people who are here. And I will say this, I've traveled through over 35 states, been through in this past year, Florida, Texas, Arizona, California, Maine. And every place I've been, their Confederate flags up. And every place I've been, I've also met some really cool people. And, and so I would like to say in this notion of mind real estate, the simulacrum and this, this copy of a copy of a photograph that was never true in the first place. So however we're looking at it, I'd like us to remember that there is no unified perspective on the pastoral here and that I have a yard where I lay out in it, enjoy the sun and listen to the birds. Uh, I also know that I'm one of how many people in my entire social circle that wants to do that, not has the opportunity, but to where they're even interested, to where that's a value to them. Then there is a community of people who can't, whether it's due to access, mobility, whether it's due to the cost of doing this, whether it's due to possible um, intimidation and, and the disinterest in the outdoors. I think when we think of how nature is viewed, if you were of African descent and you came from a place that was already urbanized, like people think Africans came here from a less civilized place in America. We have to remember that Timbuktu and some of the earliest libraries were in Africa. So it's not like Black people all were running around in the jungles in Africa came here and was like, oh, they, they, no. But on the other hand, we had been farming and doing agriculture for 100,000 years. So we brought over techniques here and we're heavily involved with the land. So I, I'm interested in excavating those histories of the people that have been involved, excavating the histories of people that have been misnomered because as of now, Lebanese and Middle Easterns are considered white by the US Census. So our understanding of black land ownership is probably off. And to excavate what the other means by which information was communicated, like the quilts. If we weren't making the paintings or we weren't necessarily being published, there were other ways we were exchanging information. And so finding those, those methods to then understand some of the pastoral or recreational life and its representations could be pretty interesting. Well, I um, think that might be a good topic for next year's um, talk. We've gone like way over. I'm afraid I really feel like we're gonna be rude. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I have to take stuff. off and go build some stuff. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to hit me up. It's so Black Land Ownership. We are doing a, um, a Q&A after Aviva for all three. And unfortunately, I got to shed to build. This, we, you see my hands, they come up. I work. I enjoy this conversation. I enjoy academia. I, I'm out here in the woods, Black land ownership. I got to put work in. You all have a wonderful day. Well, you have a good day on your land. Thank you for, um, thank you for joining us. Thank you all.
So, um, and so just to wrap it up, because um, I'm so sorry I'm cutting in um, to more time, just um, so, um, and I think I agree with Christoph, you know, about the, you know, just um, the pastoral is a myth. There's always an agenda behind it. And, um, and breaking that myth, I think, and redefining it is what's going to begin, you know, land justice, which is tied with racial justice and environmental justice. Um, thank you. And I'm going to um, take my screen sharing off so we can get to Aviva. Thank you for your time. Thank you all. So Adrian, shall we start? Um, and Adrian, could you please tell me how much time I have now? Yeah, so I'm going to start sharing screen right now. Let Thank me put it into presentation mode. And we have um, about 15 minutes if we want to allow for a few minutes of Q&A at the end. We certainly do, or at least I do. Well, I am Aviva Ramani, and I'm calling in from Wabanaki land, unceded territory. I'm on a relatively remote island about 15 miles out to sea. And I've lived here for about 34 years. This is Gauguin's famous painting about who we are, where are we going, and so on and so forth. He, he might be considered the first gentrifier. He also went to an island that was relatively remote at the time and he presented a very romantic idea. Um, right now, things are not so romantic on this island, and that's why I'm coming in without a virtual image. Um, I had two systems crash on me. And what's interesting about the crash is that we now are functioning very comfortably in virtual space, and that's almost a denial of the very premise of why we would even consider managed retreat. Gauguin's imagery is a prototype of uh, retreating to a pristine place with the, all kinds of assumptions about culture. Let's please go to the next slide. Thank you. So reality can be voracious. Um, not only am I out of the visual practical loop of you're seeing my face, but the means for me to even be here virtually are also dependent on extractivism. Let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna try and go through these slides pretty quickly so that uh, we will have as much time as possible for Q and A. So where I live on this island is on the East Coast and my studio is three feet from deep water. And what you're looking at is just a detail of a very large painting, 76 by 86, of what the waves look like when they crash against the rocks a few feet from my studio door. Next slide, please. This is uh, an image from the Marshall Islands and another set of islands, extremely threatened. And I have an interest in them because one of our original presenters was Mark Stega, who is going to be on another panel on the, I think it's the 23rd. Next, next uh, slide, please. And he sent along a poem from a Native American leader and I, Let's see, I'll just read it for you. We deserve not just to survive, we deserve to thrive. Take us along on your ride. We won't slow you down. We'll help you win the most important race of all, the race to save humanity. I happen to be very, very interested in indigenous cultures and have a number of indigenous friends who have been educating me throughout my life. And what's interesting about Mark's work and the work of other indigenous leaders is the idea that they are trying to integrate traditional knowledge with Western science. Uh, now, the only problem with that, next slide, please. 
is that I'm not sure we're going to manage retreat. In fact, I don't believe there is such a thing as managed retreat. Because where exactly are we going to retreat to? But the reason that I originally came to this island and stayed was because I bought the town dump, built a house, small, tiny house on the land and began to restore it. And um, next, this is actually a slide of Grandfather Thundercloud, a Cherokee elder who came and um, performed a medicine wheel on the site when we began in 1990. Next slide, please. So this is an image of what the site looked like in 1930 after it had been completely extracted. It became made land for the prairie, for the uh, schooners, granite schooners. And um, in the insert is what it looked like in 2010, about 10 years after I finished the pro this project of restoration. Next slide. What I learned was slowly but surely how change occurs and what is the least responsive to change seems to be the fossil fuel world. And the real question here is what has art got to do with it when you're really dealing with practical problems? But I go about that question from an artist's point of view. So I start with just let's look at the rocks. Let's try and understand how rocks have something to do with change. Next, please. This is a fishing island. So one of the first things I did was I retrieved what's called drift nets from the town dump and I put them on a bed and I meditated on that image for quite some time because what happens is the drift nets get loose from the boats, they go on fishing the sea and they strip mine marine life and they're invisible to marine life. So I thought that was like our habits and routines that end us up at the town dump. Next. So what I did with the town dump was I created a, a very methodical plan to restore it. It was all based on concentric circles. It was very much inspired by what I understood of the medicine wheel ritual and Native American approaches to land in general. Next, please. And this is a detail of some of the restored land. It had not only been strip mined, it had been dynamited. And so I replaced various boulders, created paths and systems within the site that would allow me to study the microhabitats. This particular image is part of the process of slowing down the erosion in the riparian zone that went down to an estuarine system. Next, please. So what I took away from 10 years of working on that restoration was that I was dealing with a complex adaptive system. And as in any complex adaptive system, there are a set of rules by which you can identify how a model will function. So I identified six rules and those are those six rules and they are about trying to understand where is the butterfly effect? Where is the trigger point where change starts to occur? What's called emergence in environmental science. Next please. Then I wrote a couple of books about it. I wrote a work memoir, which is Divining Chaos about uh, how I developed my thinking. Uh, art is often assumed to be somewhat passive. You, you present what you see, but I was interested in a much more analytic and proactive approach to art making. And the uh, book on the right is a series of essays on how you teach that kind of art making. Next, please. So it wasn't enough for me to uh, describe, represent, analyze what had happened on the ghost 
Stuxnet site. I needed to test theory. So I analyzed several other sites on the island. And one of them was a point where the Army Corps of Engineers 100 years ago had narrowed a causeway. And this drawing based on GIS studies, the top left yellowish circle is where that causeway was in the island and it represented a point where a number of microhabitats converged and therefore I foresaw that it would be a, a region of great fecundity if we could restore it. Next please. So the way I drew attention to the site to generate some interest was I painted all the boulders along the causeway. There are about 70 boulders and they were painted with a casein of ultramarine blue, um, which is translucent moss, local mosses to grow more moss and buttermilk, um, which made everybody in town extremely angry, which made them pay attention to the site. Next, please. And so it was restored. The USDA contributed over $500,000. And the result was the 30 critical area uh, acres of wetlands were restored and there is now abundant life at the site. So that was my first test. And I went along for the next 10 years or so testing various other sites. Could the same principles be applied and what might be the effect? Next, please. About 2010, when I had done about 10 years of this testing, I became aware of the issues with natural gas. And I took my trigger point theory and started trying to apply it in a series of games about how community could push back where each of the uh, participants from the audience could represent different factors like the watershed or the community, whatever. And they physically fought to maintain the space. Next, please. So the next big problem was, OK, so the big problem is fossil fuels. How do we stop them? And I had heard about an artist, Peter von Tiesenhausen, who had copyrighted the top six inches of his ranch to prevent fossil fuel people, specifically natural gas pipeline corporations from taking the land and destroying it. I was approached by a small group of activists to see if we could do something like that with the forests in upstate New York. And I designed a series of installations that were iterative based on a melodic pattern that could be observed and identified with GPS locations of trees in one third mile measures that were increments of a total symphony. And at the top, you can see the actual melodic refrain. Uh, it was performable. Uh, the design was based on what would impede heavy machinery. To the right, you see one of those trees actually in Virginia because the measures were all over the continent. And the bottom left is a map of one of those one third mile long measures with the indications of tree notes. Next, please. Next, please. And this is just a conceptual representation of how the forest became music. Next, please. So we took the issue to court. By 2018, we were deep into Trump territory in this country and activists, lawyers were intimidated and threatened by corporations and dark money. But we were able to conduct a mock trial which we won on the basis of the standing of the art, which is a whole other complicated legal issue to uh, break down. But basically we proved that the artwork was worth protecting. And if the artwork was worth protecting, then the artwork could protect the land. Next, please. 
And I should add that I'm now working on an opera about ecocide, which is based on that mock trial. So it wasn't just obviously in this country that we were destroying everything in sight. In Inner Mongolia, they are extracting rare minerals for computers, like the ones we're all using right now. And the result is that the pasture land is uh, desiccating, the water table is lowering, and the horses that are the lifeblood of the horse tribes are dying. Next, please. So the, the kinds of conflicts that I was studying between the push for exploitation and the effect on the environment were manifesting in all kinds of ways. So in 2021, I did a short residency in the UK, a virtual residency, just studying how fire regimes develop across the planet. And they seem to me to be the embodiment of a kind of mythical fire tiger creature that was being starved of forage areas. And what we needed to learn was not to control the fire, but how to interact with the fire because the fire is a source of benefits as many indigenous groups know. Next. And this is just a conceptualization of if we could think of the whole world as a musical event, then we might begin to conceptualize how habitats could be integrated with human civilization in a way that did not make culture a form of cultivation of denial. And the blue dots are places where the Blue Tree Symphony was activated across the globe. And the blue edges are what's gonna to happen to the coastline. They're gonna be underwater. Next, please. So this is a view of my studio at relatively low tide. At high tide, the waves lap around the piers at the bottom of the wharf. And it's scary. Um, so what are we gonna do about that? I'm gonna not leave. I'm not going to design a managed retreat for myself. It's kind of like um, the guy from the Arab Spring who set himself on fire. It's like, whatever, I'm gonna die here. I'm gonna die there. Next, please. And here the water is coming up against the rocks at uh, the base of my studio in a storm. Next, please. But of course, it's not that simple. We don't get to suicide ourselves to solve a problem. And I think what Mark said at the beginning is true. We have to put the pieces together. It's obviously not just Western science, indigenous people, black people. It's also art and artists because we have a different point of view about our collective visions. So that's what I am committed to right now. And when I do the opera, I hope there will be venues all over the world. I hope you'll come. It's called the Blue Trees Opera. And that is my presentation. And I hope I've left enough time for um, some Q&A. Thank you, Radley. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Noah, Charlene. Thank you, Aviva. And I'm sorry for breaking into your time again. Um, <laughs> um, but thank you. I'm glad you. Um, so, how does the QA work? Thank you. Well, this, this was great. And I guess we have maybe four minutes or so. So, I don't know. Turn it over to you all. Probably time to take one or two questions. Yes, please uh, submit any questions you have in the Q&A box on the bottom of the screen, um, and they will appear for us in the in the panel, and then we can respond to those accordingly. Um, 
Yeah, uh, but for uh, for Charlene, I'd maybe just want to start it off because I, I think there was a really interesting um, dis distinction that you were kind of that 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 you were highlighting, not that you were drawing yourself between um, the, the, this kind of colonial separation between art and folk art, between fine art and folk art on on the one hand. So art produced by sort of people in a kind of organic context and stuff, and and kind of artwork more the things that I was speaking about earlier that is taken. Um, that is that is designed to only be shown in an institutional setting, and other other forms of arts, which are a lot of ones, that some of the ones you were exploring a little bit are 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 sort of um, equally art, but not ones that have that sort of institutional backing by the kind of settler society. And I think that that's super interesting because a lot of the um, a lot of the kind of art that is used as a sort of counter to a lot of the the, the, the kind of image, imagery that we were both showing before is stuff is, is material that I think would usually fall under the the realm of, of, of folk art or craft or something and, and and I think it's kind of it's quite um, a problem to make that do you, you think Duncanson uh, fell into the craft part no I think I, I think that uh I think that the distinction between the two I I, I think it's wrong to move from one to the other when discussing um, how the art will sort of respond to managed retreat and respond to climate change. I think the more positive step is to, to see that there's no distinction between the two, that it's all, mm -hmm. that one is only in that position because there is a sort of power and institutional backing behind it that put it in a museum. Uh, and the what, what is normally, I think, denigrated with the term folk art because it is seen as kind of less than or simple handicrafts is in fact, they're in fact one and the same. Um, so because there's, a, I, it's something I noticed in this, um, in, in a kind of counter between uh, like art that could be conceived, art art for like the era of climate change um, it is usually sort of framed in that way. And I just, yeah, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Oh, on the, okay, so I'm just, I'm trying to be clear on the question, um, just the separation between art and um, fine art and folk art or high art and high and low. Um, well, in mine, I kind of just used, um, my examples were all pretty much high art, but then, except for the one example of the, um, of the print of the uh, slaves in Louisiana, um, the post, um, the post-emancipation piece, which would be more graphic arts or, but um, um, I think today, I mean, um, well, I think, hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't know how to, I don't really know how to answer that question exactly. Aviva, do you have any, th um, any thoughts? On the issue of various forms of art? Correct. Because I think you went a little deeper. Yeah, I think it's irrelevant. <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, the real question is what is conveyed by what is done. And the only question that really interests me is, uh, is it addressing the primary issues of our times or not? And however, that someone finds the right form for that, that's cool with me. That's um, really, really great to hear all these remarks and may, maybe as good a, a spot to close on um, as any. I learned so much from these uh, presentations, such a um, sort of critical perspective, a little different lens also for, 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 the, for thinking about, it, about some of these topics. So for me, it was really, really enlightening and just really want to thank um, all the speakers for, uh, for sharing with us today. Um, so with that, I, 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 again, thank all of you. Thank our attendees as well. And um, just a, a reminder that um, the conference officially starts next week on Tuesday evening. And we encourage folks to, um, to register and hope to, hope to see you there to hear about, more about these and other perspectives. So um, special thanks again to our speakers and um, have a great rest of the day and, and weekend. And long Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.